everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to turn off my video for the presentation, which will take about 10 to 15 minutes. So let me go ahead and do that so we can focus on the slides. There we go. Okay, I am thrilled to be here today to talk to you about one of my favorite subjects, thriller novels, and in particular, what makes a great thriller. Um, a little bit about me. If I can get my PowerPoint to work, there we go. Um, I'm a Long Island, New York based author. I've been writing thriller and suspense novels since 2012. My first novel was Baby Grand, which is a mob thriller, crime thriller. That is the first book of my Baby Grand trilogy, which also includes the novels Baby by Lino and Baby Carter. In November of last year, I published my fourth novel, In the Red, which is a mystery thriller that takes place on Long Island, New York. Just a quick note, those, those books there at the bottom are some nonfiction books that I've had the pleasure of working on. My, quote, day job, so to speak, is I'm a journalist, so I write nonfiction by day, thriller fiction by night. Um, I kind of lead a double life, and if you throw in being a mom, too, it's more of a triple life. Okay, so a good place to start this presentation would be to define what we mean by a thriller. What are thrillers? Well, there's really no official definition, but I think we can accurately say that thrillers tend to be dark and engrossing plot-driven stories that give readers heightened feelings of suspense, excitement, surprise, anticipation, and anxiety. Now I know what you're thinking. Can't any novel generate suspense, excitement, surprise, anticipation, and anxiety? Of course they can, but doing these things is the primary goal, the primary objective of the thriller genre. And I should note that although I use the word plot-driven in this definition, that does not mean that the characters in a thriller are not fully formed and relatable and sympathetic. Thrillers are very much about character. However, in many cases, if not most cases, characterization tends to take a backseat to plot. So how do you know you're reading a thriller? As, as Debbie said, the signs are sweaty palms, racing pulse, repeatedly staying up into the wee hours of the morning to keep reading or missing your train stop because you just had to see how things were going to end in the chapter. Um, how do thriller authors do this? What techniques do they use to achieve their, their devious plan to have you lose sleep and be late for work? Um, I've put together a list of the 10 main elements or techniques that authors use to write an edge of your seat read. So let's, let's dive right in. The first element is a gripping opening chapter. The introduction, the prologue, or the first chapter of a good thriller really sets the pace for the rest of the book. It is usually intense. It is usually compelling. The author is probably not going to cram in a lot of backstory or character information or any detailed histories in the opening chapter. That stuff comes later. Instead, the author will get right to the action as in chapter one of The Silent Patient by Alex Michaelides, which begins with, Alicia Berenson was 33 years old when she killed her husband. Bam, in one sentence, there is death, there is violence, and we have barely just begun. That is a thriller. The second main element of a great thriller is a protagonist we wanna root for. While protagonists or main characters of thrillers have traditionally been men, women lead characters are increasingly common. Thriller protagonists may be ordinary citizens who may be unaccustomed to danger, or they may be police officers, FBI agents, lawyers, detectives. Whatever their background, the main character of a thriller usually has a solid moral code. They are honorable, we like them. A lot of the time, authors will make their protagonists someone 
who has been hurt or deceived in the past in some way, which makes them more sympathetic to the reader. Like Lisbeth Salander, who's pictured here um, in the Girl, with the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series by Stieg Larsson, um, who has become the woman she has become with her piercings and strange behaviors because of the things that have happened to her in her childhood. Um, in this photo, Lisbeth is played by Nomi, Nomi Rapas, who starred in the Swedish films based on the book series. Um, you may know that in the American film version of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the actress who played Lisbeth was Rooney Mara. And I believe there is an adaptation of another book in the series where the character of Lisbeth was played by actress Claire Foy of, of The Crown fame. Okay, the third main element of a great thriller is, of course, a villain we love to hate or a villain we hate to love. Sometimes I think those are interchangeable. Um, and what character can better symbolize that than Thomas Harris's Hannibal Lecter, played by Anthony Hopkins in the film adaptation of The Silence of the Lambs? I must say that this is one of my favorite attributes of a thriller the villain. In my Baby Grand series, I've sought to create my own kind of uh, Hannibal Lecter in my villain, Don Bailino. Uh, thriller's villain, or you can also call him or her the antagonist, needs to be as determined and clever as the protagonist, but rather than honorable, he or she is usually utterly immoral and terrifying. It helps if the reader can see the villain in action and can see the crimes taking place. Uh, this makes us despise the antagonist even more and adds to the excitement. The fourth main element of a thriller is a quest. What kind of quest? Usually it's big. Usually it's to prevent some sort of disaster from taking place, um, to keep the planet from being taken over by aliens, to keep the bad guy from kidnapping a child, to keep dinosaurs from killing everyone, as with uh, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, which is one of my favorite thrillers. And usually at the end of the book, the protagonist's quest has been successful. Um, unhappy or unresolved endings are usually saved for a literary fiction. In thrillers, the protagonist overcomes the antagonist usually, if only by an inch. Unless, of course, there is a sequel to the book, in, in which case all bets are off. Okay, the fifth main element of an edge of your seat read is another one of my favorite techniques as a thriller writer, multiple points of view. What does this mean? Well, it might mean that some chapters of the book are told through the eyes of our hero. Other chapters may be from the perspective of another character, perhaps law enforcement or someone in the media, and other chapters may be from the perspective of our villain. Why do authors use these kinds of shifting points of view? Well, because it adds interest and complexity to the novel by allowing readers to see the story, to see the book from different angles. It also enables the author to increase those feelings of anxiety or dread that we talked about at the beginning because multiple points of view can give readers a heads up in a lot of cases about what's coming in the thriller. Um, for example, sometimes readers will know more than the characters themselves. Let's say our hero is on his way to save the town from the clutches of our evil villain. That is his quest, right? Well, in the previous chapter, which was told from the villain's point of view, the reader found out that the villain has set a trap for him. So as we're reading this chapter from our hero's point of view, we're thinking, no, it's a trap. Don't do it, don't go there. That sense of anxiety or anticipation has been heightened in the viewer. Uh, two thrillers I've read recently that employ this kind of multiple points of view technique. Although to be honest, I'm hard pressed to come up with a thriller that does not use this technique. Um, our Lisa Jewell's Then She Was Gone and Michael Robotham's The Secret She Keeps, uh, both excellent thrillers. Okay, the sixth element of a great thriller is a ticking clock. Thrillers have a race against time aspect to them, something that adds to the suspense 
and fuels the reader's adrenaline rush. Sometimes it's a literal ticking time bomb and the protagonist has to, I don't know, untie himself and escape before it goes off. Or the protagonist may have to rescue a kidnapped child before the ransom money is paid. Life and death are usually in the balance when it comes to thrillers. Now, John Grisham is a master of this technique, whether it's Mitch McDeer trying to take down the mob before they find out what he's up to in the firm, or Adam Hall, who only has days, hours, minutes to save his grandfather, who'll be sentenced to death in two days in the chamber. A ticking clock really helps to keep readers glued to their books to see what happens next. The seventh element of a great thriller, twists and turns. So much of a thriller's excitement hinges on the unexpected twists and turns of a novel. Thriller novelists like to subvert their readers' expectations and throw unpredictable roadblocks in the protagonist's path. Think of a cat and mouse game between hero and villain, constant pursuit, near captures, and repeated escapes. Also under twists and turns, I, I need to say that thrillers have um, a tendency, they like to make their protagonists miserable. Um, they write the worst thing that could happen to their protagonist and then make it worse. Um, they give them grief and then false hope and then heartache, anxiety, near-death experiences. Generally speaking, thriller authors don't want their protagonist to win really until the end of the book. I think of David Baldacci's books such as Absolute Power, um, when I think of twists and turns, um, in particular, Absolute Power is about a burglar named Luther Whitney, who was played by Clint Eastwood in the film, um, who breaks into a Virginia mansion and witnesses a brutal crime involving the president of the United States, a man who believes he can get away with anything. And now Luther may be the only one who can stop him. Okay, the eighth element of a great thriller is the cliffhanger, which I have illustrated here with our friend Sylvester Stallone, who is pictured in a still from his film titled, you guessed it, Cliffhanger. Each chapter of a great thriller should end with some sort of cliffhanger that compels the reader to keep reading. There's nothing like a stunning shock, a confession, or just an unforeseen twist to encourage the reader to keep turning the pages. When the hero lands in deep trouble before the end of a section or chapter, stretching their determination, bravery, and physical abilities to the max, the reader will want to see if they come up on top and they keep reading. Um, James Patterson is a master of the cliffhanger. I'm personally particularly fond of his earlier novels like Kiss the Girls, which feature Patterson's popular Alice Cross character. That was one of those novels that I just couldn't put down after each chapter. Also, The Day After Tomorrow, um, which isn't as well known as um, a lot of other thrillers by Alan Folsom, um, is one of my favorites. It's about a young American doctor haunted by his father's murder who stumbles into a chilling international conspiracy. Um, that book was glued to my fingers as I was commuting from Queens to Manhattan, New York every day back in the 90s when I was working as an editor. Okay, the ninth element of a great thriller is a strong narrative thrust. I always describe this element as a runaway train. Um, the train is just getting faster and faster, teetering on the rails, sparks flying, brakes are broken, can't slow down. That's strong narrative thrust. The, the pacing is high, each scene, each chapter reveals something new, no matter how slight it is. Some thriller chapters, I'm sure you're aware, may be only a page or two long. Um, thriller authors really aren't big on writing stuff that has nothing to do with the story. There's always this feeling that there's no time to waste. Um, there are short sentences, short paragraphs, short chapters. Um, thriller authors tend to get to the point. And why do they do that? because dull moments will lose an audience for them and thriller writers really can't afford to lose an audience, not even for a page. A good example of a page turning thriller with a strong narrative thrust is The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Listen to this premise. While in Harvard, 
I'm sorry, while in Paris, Harvard symbologist Robert Langdon is awakened by a phone call in the dead of the night. The elderly curator of the Louvre has been murdered inside the museum, his body covered in baffling symbols. Langdon and a French cryptologist together sort through the bizarre riddles and discover a trail of clues hidden in the works of Leonardo da Vinci. What's more, the elderly curator who was killed, he was involved in a secret society whose members included Sir Isaac Newton, Victor Hugo, and da Vinci, and he guarded a breathtaking historical secret. Now, doesn't that sound like a book you'd like to read? I know it sounds like a book I'd like to read. Um, but also what I love about the Da Vinci Code too is that thrillers sometimes get a bad rap for being, I don't know, for being drivel or not very sophisticated. And um, what's interesting about the Da Vinci Code is it's really steeped in art history. You feel like you're learning something as you read. Um, just like you feel like you're really getting a lesson in military history or military life when you read Tom Clancy's novels. Um, the characters in the Da Vinci Code are highly intellectual, the conspiracies are intricate and uh, really beautifully drawn. It's, it's one of my favorite thrillers of all time. Okay, now the tenth and final element of a great thriller is a memorable or surprise ending. A great thriller has a killer ending, so to speak, an ending that leaves you breathless and exhausted, an ending that will stay with you for days, if not weeks, after reading the final page. Sometimes the ending of a thriller is so memorable that it will change the entire meaning of the story and force you to rethink everything you thought was real up until that point. What's funny is sometimes, and this is kind of an aside, but sometimes I'll visit with a book club and someone will say to me, I'm thinking of a Long Island book club in particular, someone will say to me that they like to read the last page of a book before starting the book. And my first thought is, ack, you know, that, that's just, no, don't do it. That is just sacrilege to a thriller author because we have painstakingly plotted our books to reach a certain crescendo, a certain destination or moment, and reading the ending before you begin just takes away so much of that, the fun of the ride. Um, but I digress. Um, <laughs> when I think of this memorable um, or surprise ending, I think of two thrillers in particular. I can clearly remember reading the last page of The Da Vinci Code, which we talked about for the previous point. Um, I was lying on my bed in my bedroom. I had just finished the book, and I remember just turning over and staring at the ceiling for like 15 minutes, just contemplating what I had just read. Um, I won't give anything away in case you haven't read the book or seen the, um, the film starring Tom Hanks, but it was pretty mind blowing. Um, and the second book I think of was Primal Fear by William Deal. Forget about the last page. In this book, the last sentence changed everything about the story and just completely rocked my world. I was, I was so enamored with this technique and specifically from reading the technique in this particular book, I was so enamored with it that I employed it in each of the three books um, in my Baby Grand Trilogy. Um, and there you have it. Um, those are my 10 elements of a great thriller. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions about this presentation, um, please put your questions in the chat box and I'd be happy to answer them. Now let me unshare my screen. Let's see, and turn my video back on. Let's see if I can do that. Um, how do I turn my video back start on? Start video. Oh, I know what I did here. Yeah, at the bottom of the screen, you start there video. There we go. Um, All right, while you're figuring that I'm out. Getting <laughs> <laughs> that I'm getting there. I'm getting there. That was great. Um, we, let's see, we have a couple of, uh, questions already. How you doing? I'm getting there. Hold on. Here we okay. Go. Do you see me? There you go. Yeah. Okay. I don't see there. myself though. I lost my ability to see. Well, okay. you're, we see. I'll you. go with so, it. <laughs> uh, try push, putting yourself, uh, pressing speaker view. Can you? Uh, you know what? I lost my screen somehow. I don't know why it disappeared. Well, we can hear you. Okay. So, anyway. Um, can you see me? I can see, we can see you and hear you. Yes. Okay, good. 
Okay, so we have a couple of questions, so we'll, we'll take those. One from Rhonda. What's the difference between a thriller and a mystery? Great question. That is a great question. Um, a mystery is, um, a thriller can be a mystery. Like my, my final book, as I was saying, is a mystery thriller in the red, where there's some sort of a puzzle to solve. Um, usually there's, uh, usually there's a, a murder or some, some kind of crime has been committed and uh, there's a detective or in a cozy mystery, just a regular average person who's out there trying to figure out, put the pieces of the puzzle together and solve that mystery. Um, so there's sort of, they're, they don't necessarily have to be the same thing, but they can be. A thriller is something where there's just like a, like you said in the beginning, there's this strong, pace and there's it's dark and there's a lot of movement but uh, a mystery itself is not necessary to be called a thriller so it's it's one's just putting the pieces of a puzzle together and the other one is just this dark uh book with uh, a high pace does that hey. make sense yes now uh next questions are your books available on audio as audio books Yes, they are. Um, the, the, my, final, my last book is not, but the Baby Grand Trilogy is available, all three books on Audible. Okay, and Sandy is asking, do you have the whole plot figured out before you start writing, or does it come to you as you write? You know, it's funny you should ask that because I'm currently working on a book now, and it's a science fiction slash dystopian thriller. And um, I'm what they call a pantser. They, they have, you have, you have plotters, writers who are plotters and writers who are pantsers. And I happen to be a pantser, which means that I just sort of sit down one day at my computer, write chapter one, and then I just write by the seat of my pants. I, I don't really make any, any of those elaborate backstories or I don't, I really don't know anything about my characters before I actually sit down and start writing. And then once I start writing, that's when I really, learn about those characters. So I have this general idea when I sit down to write a book of what's going to happen. A lot of times I'll know how my book is going to end, um, but how I get there, what the characters are like, um, I, have, I, I have no idea. I figure it out as I go. And a lot of times I will be in the middle of writing a book and I've come to know, or towards the end, and I've come to know them so well that I'm able to go back and rewrite those earlier chapters where I was sort of just floundering. Um, so yeah, I'm considered a pantser and I just sort of, I just go. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question from Lindsay. Uh, who are your favorite female thriller authors? You know, um, when I first started reading, I was thinking about this the other day, when I first started reading thrillers was when I was working as an editor, I mentioned it before, in the 90s, and I was sitting on the bus. I lived in what was called a two-fare zone in um, the borough of Queens, and so in order to get from my house to Manhattan, it, as the crow flies, it was probably only seven miles, but to get there, I had to take a bus to another bus, to a train, to another train, so I was doing a lot of reading. And at the time I was reading, my favorite authors were James Patterson, um, Michael Crichton, uh, John Grisham, a lot of the authors I talked about today. But if someone asks me now who some of my favorite authors are, and I don't, I, I wouldn't even think of them as just female authors, they're my favorite authors, I would say Lisa Jewell, um, I mentioned one of her books in the presentation, and also Gillian Flynn. Um, I just loved Gone Girl, but I also loved Sharp Objects and Dark Places even more than Gone Girl. I think she's a phenomenal writer, and I just really love her dark sensibility. Lisa Jewell, too, they have, um, there's, there's, a, there's a darkness to their thrillers, as there should be, um, but uh, there's something about their writing that I just, I, I think is really terrific. Okay, from Naomi, did you have a defining moment that led you to be a writer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, a defining moment. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I, when I, I recently was looking through some old things um, from when I was a child and I found these pieces of construction paper from when I was like eight or nine years old and they had stories written on them in magic marker. I mean, they weren't elaborate stories, but it was, they were stories. And so I've had this idea of being a writer or an author for a very long time. 
Um, and what's interesting about those stories that I found is even at a very young age, I was writing thrillers. I was writing, I mean, I remember one of the stories was something like, mommy is not home. It's dark outside. I hear a noise. Someone's coming up the stairs, like that kind of thing. So I was, I don't know why I always say to people, I had a really great childhood, a very happy childhood. I don't know where this, this love of suspense comes from, but I seem to have always had it. Um, so I don't know if there was a defining moment. Um, I just knew it was something that I wanted to do. But interestingly, um, I didn't think I was a very, I didn't think I could do it. When I first started out in this writing journey, um, I was in school when I was in high school, I was a math and science whiz. I was really good in those subjects. I was good in English, but not as good as the other subjects. And, but for some reason, my passion was with words. It was with English. And so that was the career I chose. And um, I found myself on these high school newspaper and that type of writing really suited me. It was very direct. It was like we were talking about short sentences. You get to the point, not a lot of flowery description. And so I decided to go to college. I went to Hofstra University majoring in journalism. And so I'm a journalist to this day. But um, the great thing about journalism is I think it really taught me how to be a thriller author. It really taught me about just um, how it taught me about description, how to walk into a room and to really observe what was going on around me, how to describe what was going on around me. Um, I was meeting all kinds of people with all different backgrounds. I was listening to dialects. I was listening to the way they speak, the way they moved. Um, and over the years, I just thought to myself, well, you know, my, my career is going well. And um, I've got this dream somewhere inside of me of writing thrillers. And so, you know, I'm not getting any younger. Um, I'm going, I feel confident enough after all this time to give it a try. And that's how I became a thriller author. I, I became one through journalism. Um, and I don't know if I could have been one without journalism, which is interesting. Um, so there wasn't really a defining moment. It was sort of gradual um, over the course of my life. Okay, and from Ruth, she says, can you recreate a regular story into a thriller? Can you recreate one into a thriller? Um, just a regular, a regular book? I, I, I think what she's asking is, if you have a, just a regular story, like, what do you do to make it a thriller? I, and if, if I'm wrong, Ruth, just send a chat back. <laughs> Um, you know, that, yeah, you certainly can. Um, I think using a lot, using those 10 elements that we talked about today, right? At the end of each chapter, make it some sort of a cliffhanger. Um, make sure there are twists and turns. Make sure there's some sort of a quest. Um, you know, have an antagonist, have a villain, you know, have this hero character, have them at odds, you know, have that cat and mouse game going on. Um, I would think that just about any story can be turned into a thriller um, if you've got the imagination um, to do so. Okay, question from Molly. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get writer's block? If so, how do you get past it? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I get writer's, writer's block all the time, all the time. And I'm always approached by aspiring authors saying, I can't seem to find the right words. And I feel like saying to them, welcome to the club. But, you know, we're, we're, I, I've talked to all kinds of authors, authors that are towards the end of their careers, authors that are just starting. We all suffer. Most, I can't say everyone, but virtually all of us suffer from some form of writer's block. Um, sometimes the words just aren't coming. Um, you know, I, there's this, this myth out there that we should only write when we're inspired to write. Um, but if I waited around to only write when I was inspired, I probably would never get anything written. Um, there's a lot of pushing going on um, as I'm writing my books. I have to sit down and push myself. So, and sometimes, like I said, the words aren't coming. So what do I do? I think it, it depends on the day. Sometimes I will push through. I will just write anything just to get words on a page just so um, something's there that I can work with. Other times I'm just not, it's not coming, so I will go for a walk. Sometimes I'll go for a drive. Sometimes I'll take a shower, something simple as that, or get something to eat. Um, also what I like to do is I'll just 
switch gears and I'll do a different kind of writing. Like maybe I'll work on um, a newspaper or feature article that I'm, that I have to hand in, you know, in the coming days or just a different kind of writing just to get that switch and maybe that'll spark something in me. So depending on the day, um, I do different things, but yes, writer's block happens to me all the time. <laughs> I'm getting really great questions. So here's oh, one that, that, I wish uh, I could see. That, uh, that I've always wondered about uh, from Karen, who was the likable protagonist in Gone Girl? Oh in your my intro, gosh. intro, you said it should be a likable protagonist. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, Gillian Flynn sort of subverted some of those rules, some of those elements that I talked about. That's a good question. I, 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 <laughs> I guess I was talking more of the traditional thriller. Um, I don't know if any of the characters in Gone Girl um, I would consider a likable. Um, I don't know if that's, if I, I'm not really answering your question, but I would, I would say none of them. And that's okay. You know, that's okay. I, I, that still qualifies as a thriller. I mean, these 10 elements, um, most thrillers have. Um, clearly not every thriller is going to have all 10 of them. Um, there are probably some other elements too that I didn't include in today's presentation that are part of the whole thriller genre. Um, but yeah, Gone Girl is one of those situations where um, I, I really can't say either one of them is really, you know, who the hero is and who the villain. It's, they sort of, it depends on the chapter. Okay, and uh, from Karen, how much research do you do for your stories? How important is historical accuracy? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I, I don't really do a lot of research at all. And I think it's because I am a journalist and my life as a journalist is all research. It's all accuracy. It's, it's validating things. It's confirming facts. It's making sure I get it right. And so when it comes to my fiction, I just sort of sit down and let my imagination fly. I don't do a lot of research at all. Now that said, um, I did travel to Albany, New York when I was writing Baby Grand because the, um, the crime happens at the executive mansion in Albany. And I wanted to just sort of take a tour of the building and just get a feel for the place. Um, I did the same thing for Baby Carter, which a lot of it takes place in Washington, D.C. And so I took a trip down there and sort of got the lay of the land. Um, I visited the Capitol building and I got some really interesting real life information um, that I was able to put into my books. Um, but overall, I don't really strive for accuracy, so to speak, in my books. I really strive for believability. Is somebody willing to take this ride with me? Are, are you willing to believe that this is possible? And I'll give you an interesting, um, something that happened to me. I was at a book club and um, we were talking about Baby Grand and one of the scenes in Baby, in one of the scenes, um, somebody who's really drunk comes in um, to visit somebody who's on death row. And one of the people, one of the members of the book club said to me, I read that scene and it just, that would never happen. They would never let somebody who was drunk come visit somebody on death row in the visitation room. And so when she said that, I thought, well, wow, I never, I never even considered that. She said, I'll, I'll show you. I'll call my brother. He works at Rikers Island. So while we were at the meeting, he te she texted her brother. And within 10 minutes, her brother had texted back saying, of course they'd let him in. Nobody cares. And so I ended up being correct. He, somebody was, would, would be allowed to come into the visitation room crazy drunk. Um, but even so, her response to her brother's text was, well, I don't believe it anyway. So, and I found that to be really interesting because factually I had gotten that detail correct, but she still wasn't willing to believe that that could be so. So th I think that's where I fall. I'm really looking for, overall, I mean, she's not going to believe that could happen and, and it could, um, but I'm really striving for um, that sort of believability um, rather than accuracy overall. But like I said, the journalist in me likes to put in some real life um, information, like some accurate information, or if I'm talking about, you know, um, trying to think, I'm thinking of, uh, like I said, Tom Clancy, who does a lot of military 
writing um, a lot, you know, those are intricate scenes where he's really incorporating everything he knows about the military into those thrillers. Um, I generally don't do that. I'm not, I don't feel like I'm there necessarily for um, a history lesson, but I will throw in historical facts. Um, for instance, um, when I talk about my characters who are mobsters, I'm always referencing real life mobsters and I'm referencing people like Elliot Ness um, because I feel like doing so helps you believe that my characters are mobsters too. Um, but like I said, it's just here and there or I'll do some spot research. Let's say for instance, I am doing a scene, um, a, a visitation room in a, in a prison. I'll think to myself, well, what do those rooms really look like? And so maybe I'll do a quick Google search and I'll look at the images and I'll look around and, and go, oh, that's interesting. But then I will come up with whatever I think that room looks like as opposed to making it look exactly like a room, say, from a real life prison. So um, to answer your question, to make a long story short, um, I, I do some research, I have taken trips, I do some spot Googling, but overall, um, I just write totally from my imagination. Okay, this is from Donna, who Hi. says, Hi, Donna. I loved the Baby Grand Trilogy. Yay! But as uh -oh. a woman, <laughs> I, ha it's, it's, I have a problem with women falling in love with their tormentors. Is there a reason you wanted that to happen? Or was it just to add conflict or to show Don B as a somewhat sympathetic character? Now, it's interesting, Donna, that you say that my main character fell in love with the villain. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't necessarily, I, no one said that in the book. Um, I, I, this is something we talk about at book clubs all the time. Um, because uh, I would say half the room will think that Jamie Carter has fallen in love with um, Don Bailino, who's the villain. And then half the room will say, no, she hasn't. She's just fooling him. And, and um, I, I make it a point not to really answer those questions. Um, but um, it's interesting that you're, you're, that you're saying that she fell in love with him because I, I don't know if that's true, if she, if she has. Um, so, but if she had, and I'm not saying she did, but if she, if she had, um, yeah, I think I was interested in that, that conflict and that, that um, I'll give you a, one scene in particular that comes to mind. This person, Don Bailino, has abducted Jamie Carter for this, this plan to um, take care of this infant child so they can get um, a mob boss off death row, right? So they're, while, while she's in this place where, they ha where they're keeping her hostage, there's this, this other bad guy who comes and he is, is more violent, he's more vile than Don Bailino. And so there's a moment in Baby Grand where Jamie finds herself looking for Don Bailino for assistance, who, who almost is the hero in the situation because there's this other villain who has come on the scene. So I found, and she even thinks about how crazy that is that the person who abducted her, who brought her to this place and, and pulled her away from her life, is now the person that she's looking to to save her. So there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, you know, is Don Bailino good, bad? You know, I, like I said, um, there's a lot of aspects of Hannibal Lecter there where, you know, he's such a popular character. Um, same with um, Tony Soprano on The Sopranos. So, such a popular character so likable and you know, there were people all over the world falling in love with that character um including myself and i'd be watching one episode of the sopranos and thinking you know tony soprano is not so bad he's just completely misunderstood and then the next week he would do something so horrific and i would say to myself oh my gosh what was i thinking um so i was kind of going for that i was going for that do you do we like this person the villain don bailino do we not like him and i think that's something that jamie carter is sort of dealing with as well um i i won't say if she's fallen in love with him i i i'm i those words are really never spoken in the books um but that's definitely something that i'm playing with as as an author and, and if i might add the um the opening scene of Baby Grand 
a very suspenseful opening scene it takes place okay. with Brian, Brian Park right here yes. in, in the city. And I have to tell you, every time I walk through Bryant Park now, I'm extra alert. Oh, that's so <laughs> funny. That's actually how the scene got started. Um, I, at the time, I mentioned I was working in the city as an editor. And my, I was working on 34th Street. And my husband was working on 47th Street. And so on really sunny days, we would meet sort of halfway at 40th Street and eat at Bryant Park. And one day I was waiting for him because he is always late. And I was sitting there and it was a beautiful day and the park was packed. And I was sitting there like the thriller author that I am thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if somebody were abducted on this beautiful day in a crowded park and nobody saw it? And that's where that was sort of the genesis of that scene. Um, okay, from Sally, did you have unusually thrilling dreams as a child? Yes, and I still do, which is crazy. And I, I was thinking about this the other day. I was talking to my daughter. I don't know why. I have had nightmares <laughs> my whole life. I don't, I don't know why. Um, and what's funny is the, the dystopian novel I'm working on actually came from a nightmare. Um, yeah, so the answer to your question is yes, I've I've, and, and the funny thing is sometimes I have such a nightmare and I wake up, you know, in a fright, um, that if I go back to sleep, I go right back into the same nightmare. It's, it's, it's bizarre, but yeah, I've been having, I mean, I have, I have nice dreams too, uh, but I do, <laughs> I've had very, very, um, strong nightmares since the time I was a little girl. I don't know why. I don't know why I had really nice childhood. Uh, okay, Nancy uh, is asking if there's a reason why your books are not available on audio through, the, I guess, the New York Public Library. Oh, they're, they're only available um, through audible.com on audio, I should say. Yeah, you not, the audio books you're not going to find at the library, um, only on audible. Um, I'm working on the, the audio book for In the Red right now, so that will be available elsewhere, but right now the trilogy is only available on um, audible.com. Okay, another uh, question from, from Sally. Uh, it would be fun to know if your math background has played a part in your books. Oh my gosh, what a great question. Um, I, off the top of my head, I, I can't think that it has. <laughs> um, I, I don't think so. But that, that's a great, I've never been asked that before. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it has. Um, and, and sadly, I have to say, I don't think I'm as good as, in math as I used to be. Um, you know, how you, 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 if you don't use it, you lose it. I think, I think I've lost it. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Oh, from Robbie. Uh, who's your favorite author? I guess just author in general. I'm reading that question, yes. Um... If I had to pick my favorite of all time, I would say Michael Crichton. Um, I just loved his, he, he has such detailed writing. Um, and like I mentioned during the presentation, Jurassic Park, and I had seen the movie um, before I read the book, and Jurassic Park was such a thrill ride. And because he has um, a background in, in medicine, I don't know if a lot of people know that he's, so he was sort of, I, I believe he's, he is a doctor or he was, he was studying to be a doctor. And then he veered off and became a thriller author. So his books are filled with a lot of um, technical, you know, jargon and, and, and it, it makes you believe that what he's telling you is real. It makes you believe that, you know, in prehistoric times, a mosquito got caught in sap on a tree, you know, and had the had just sucked the blood from a dinosaur and, and it's still intact. And now they were taking that blood and, and creating dinosaurs in modern day. Um, you're you're willing to, to take the ride with him because he is so good at just at painting that picture and providing you with information that's like I said, sounds believable. It sounds like it could happen. And so um, yeah, I would say he is probably my all-time favorite thriller author. And I believe he was from Long Island or lived on what, Long Was Island. he from Long Island? Oh, I gosh. believe so. I believe he lived in Roslyn. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, okay. D 
do you, from Karen, do you read non-thrillers in order to escape? In quotes. If so, what, <laughs> I must what, escape. What genre? Yes, I, I may actually make it a point to read all kinds of books. Um, from historical fiction to nonfiction to, you know, anything that, you know, I hear is a good book. Um, I just read A Gentleman in Moscow because it was recommended to me by one person who said that, you know, it, it, she's in a book club and she was saying half of her, the members of the book club hated it and half of the members of the book club loved it. And so, but she, she really loved it. And I have to say, I, it, it's historical fiction and it takes place in the 1920s in Russia. Um, it doesn't sound like a book that I would be interested in necessarily, but it has become probably my, what, if not one of my all-time favorite books, probably my all-time favorite book. It was such a wonderful, beautifully written story. Um, and so, yeah, so to answer your question, I read everything that I can. I recently read Becoming by Michelle Obama, which I absolutely loved. I read Maria Shriver's new book, a nonfiction book. Um, um, what was it called? I, I was thinking something like that. I, something I was thinking dot, dot, dot. Um, so yeah, so I read, I always make sure I stick in a thriller here and there. So I'll read a thriller and then I'll read something else and then something else. And then I'll go back to the thriller just to see what people are doing and, you know, the new stories that are coming out, but I'll read, I'll read anything. Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask the last question. Okay. Uh, so in a, in a, I was reading a recent Washington Post column about some new just published thrillers and the writer quotes author P.B. James who wrote, crime fiction confirms our belief, despite some evidence to the contrary, that we live in a rational, comprehensible, and moral universe. So how, how do thrillers help us escape from the real world, if, if just for a short time? Yeah, you know, you think about what's happening in the world today. Um, it's, 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 it's scary, it's confusing, um, and I think that what thrillers are able to do is, like you said, it's an escape. You know, thrillers are big, they're loud, they're in-your-face stories, some of them with really outrageous and exciting plots, even sometimes even preposterous plots, um, that they really help you sort of tune out the real world um, and focus on the story. Um, also, and I talked about this earlier, um, you know, the world of thrillers, it makes sense, you know, um, Gillian Flynn aside, <laughs> there's usually a good guy, you know, there's a hero and there's a bad guy. And we, we know the difference between the two and the, the bad guy is vanquished and the hero um, is victorious. Um, and I think in very difficult times, um, crime thrillers or mystery thrillers, thrillers as a, as a genre, they really allow us to escape into a rational universe. Um, and that is, I think, even though thrillers are just exciting, that aspect of it is very calming. Um, because like I said, it makes sense to us. And sometimes we need things just to make sense. Okay, Dina, thank you so much. That was oh, just great. And thanks for all the great questions to yes, our Yes, thank you. Viewers. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. And thanks, uh, uh, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you at the next one. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.